Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Log Talk with Pertinier Outdoors. This is your host, Billy, and this is episode 97. I think I said that last week, but that was a lie. I can't keep track of the numbers. Um, well, I could keep track of the numbers if I was paying attention to what I'm doing, but half the time I'm not. So uh, if you've been listening f- to all 97 of these, you clearly understand that. Uh, this week's guest is Leslie Vandrew. Uh, I was excited to connect with her and to get her on here and hear a little bit about her background and hear about her nonprofit called Heroes Outdoor Therapy. Uh, pretty pretty interesting person. Uh, met her at the Hamburg Outdoor Show up here in Buffalo, New York. Uh, last, so it had been spring of 2020. Uh, that was like the first week of March, right before the pandemic officially hit and everything got shut down. So I'm glad that uh, I was there. I'm glad I was I was at the show and able to uh, to meet. Uh, Leslie was one of the few people I was able to meet and network with. And I've uh, been following along with her for the last year. And she's doing some really great things. So I wanted to get her on here, um, let her share uh, my platform or our platform for an episode and talk about uh, not just herself, but what she's up to with her, um, with Hero, at, or with HOT, sorry. Um, Heroes Outdoor Therapy is what that stands for. Um, so pretty cool discussion. I hope you enjoy it. I definitely encourage you to head over and check out both her personal, um, social media pages and her, uh, her organization's, uh, social media. There's some good stuff posted on there. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in participating or helping out at all, um, with her organization, I'm sure she would greatly appreciate that. So that's what we've got coming at you in this discussion. Um, we, are officially closed on the entry or the purchasing of the entry to the the shed fest so thank you to everybody who did sign up we've got we have exactly 120 which is awesome and uh definitely exceeded my expectations and uh bravo to all you who are participating um that's 120 memberships if you're keeping track for the national deer association so i know they will greatly appreciate that and i think you all who are participating enjoy um, if you are new members you'll enjoy the benefits of being a member of that organization so uh, i will be getting the shirts ordered this up this week uh, this will be dropping on monday and uh, i'll be working uh, to get the shirts ordered this week and i will be shipping them out before the end of the month um, that lead time shouldn't be too bad on the t-shirts going to turn around pretty quick and out the door so uh, by the end of the month you should have your new shirt and you will um also know who the winners are of the contest so it's uh it definitely we had a lot of snowpack and all throughout february as we started the contest and uh and man when that snow went it went quick and march was a beautiful month um seemed like it was hot and heavy people finding sheds early first week or two of march and then it really uh quieted down at least on my end as far as seeing people sending me pictures and tagging us and stuff um and i can relate to that it's been a this year's been a struggle compared to last i I had a, it's not like I found 20 sheds last year, but I found probably, probably eight or 10 sheds. And, um, most of them were fairly good racked bucks. So I had really high expectations going into this year. And although I'm not done yet, I got time to, uh, keep hitting the woods. I've definitely have not had the success that I had last year. So, um, the deer just seem to be, have been hiding and hanging out in different places is kind of what I'm taking from it. But, uh, I am new to this whole shed hunting game, so I can't say that I really uh, understand all the ins and outs and why the why the bucks are dropping where they are. Um, so we'll just have to see what happens the rest of time here. But uh, we're into April, hard to believe. Seems like people are having a, a great, had a great opener to the uh, trout season here uh, on the 1st. Some beautiful looking fish. The The creeks were nice and uh, weren't muddy and overflowing, um, which maybe is great right now, but not a great thing for what it looks like going into spring and summer. I hope we get a little bit more precipitation here. This is typically a pretty wet time of year, and it hasn't really precipitated all that much for the last three, four weeks. So um, definitely looks like some awesome fishing. I'll be enjoying watching everybody uh, continue to post pictures up of that. I I envy you all because I am awful at trout fishing, and I just don't have the desire at this point to uh, I've tried to get into it and it just is not my thing Um, I got to focus on what I'm good at and what I have the time to do and that's kind of where I'm at in my life so that's that right there Um, we've uh, I guess I just want to put on everybody's radar Jimbo wants to do another turkey contest like we did last year 
Um, I told him if he wants to do that, um, he's got to buck up and actually put some effort into it and he's going to run it. So we'll see if he actually, uh, you know, walks the walk and doesn't just talk the talk. Um, he and Danny have just really been dragging their schmeckles in the dirt and, uh, you know, leaving everything up to me. And Jimbo says, I just keep patting myself on the back and I guess I am because I'm the only one pulling the boat. So, um, that's a shot over the bow at both of you, Jimbo, Danny, listen, need your help here. This is not a one man organization, although it feels like it sometimes. Anywho, off my soapbox, let's, uh, let's get this episode rolling. I hope you, uh, have a great week. I hope you enjoy the discussion and, uh, keep feeding them. Hello. I, uh, yeah, yeah, that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> and really, 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 really cold and fun. Cold and fun. Cold and fun. That's good that you think of that of it because that's what deer hunting typically is, is cold and fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday morning, I'm glassing up on the pass and I see these deer moving. And I'm like, ooh, there's some deer moving. All of a sudden, I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm like, is that hard? My dad always talks what? about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So, so Robert's when you're the 275 pounds, hard. I don't know how you do that, but the Freightliner. <laughs> it's just like a creeper. He's kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. Yeah, you know, he's like, <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping it, pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. Why did you say his name? Her- Herve Velichos. <laughs> you know what pertinier means. If you know what pertinier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast brought to you by Pertinier Outdoors. There we go. There you are. <laughs> it's always a different platform that I have to use. So I know. Yeah, if everybody could just universally pick one and stick with it, right? Right. <laughs> hey, how do you say your last name just so I don't butcher it? Vandrew. Vandrew. Okay. Yeah. That sounds about, I wanted to put an L in there for some reason. I don't know why I wanted <laughs> to do that, but. Nope, it's Vandrew. Cool. So I figure we'll just, uh, talk for about an hour and just shoot the breeze. And, uh, I want to just, you and I had run into each other last spring, but, uh, right. you know, we've kind of, kind of stayed in touch following along with you, but you've definitely got a lot of really cool stuff going on and just wanted to kind of get your, your two kind of your personal brand as well as the hero, uh, brand out there as well. I think you got some yeah. awesome stuff going on. So sounds good. Ready to rip. I'm ready. All right. Okay. So this week we are joined by Leslie Vandrew. I did it. I nailed it. Um, so Leslie's jumping on here with us today to, uh, talk a little about, a little bit about what she has going on. Um, and Leslie and I met each other last spring at the Western New York, uh, sports expo, I believe is what they call it, but basically just the outdoor show here in Western New York. And, uh, Leslie came up to the booth I was working at and, introduced herself and you were just like all fired up about everything and I'm like who is this girl I have no idea I'm, I'm a people person <laughs> you, you sure are so yeah it was it was a pleasure meeting you that day and I started following along with you on Instagram and uh and it's been it's been awesome to see all the stuff that you're up to so um there's my little introduction of who you are so I don't know if you want to say anything else about where you're coming from anything like that Right. Like Billy said, I met him right before COVID and right before all the expos started locking down. Um, just a little back brief of who, where I, who I am and where I come from. I was born in upstate New York and I was raised in New Jersey. And I actually did not even grow up fishing or hunting. This is all relatively new to me. If you actually uh, look back, probably I would say in the last six to seven years is when I started doing anything outdoors whatsoever. I didn't know you were born in New York. That's neat. Yeah. Where, whereabouts? Uh, Newburgh. Okay. Upstate. Yeah. That's not upstate. Get I knew here. I was going to get. Oh my God. <laughs> Everyone that is from upstate, upstate, that, that's not upstate. It's it's upstate because it's not. But if you're in not the boroughs, in but... Jersey or New York in the city, then you're, you might as well be upstate, upstate. Right. 
<laughs> no, you're right. I'll give that to you. But you know, <laughs> those of us way up north, we uh, we say that's bull. But we'll we'll let you join right. in. <laughs> Just like Jersey and the Jersey Shore are two different worlds. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, I also served in the military. I was in the United States Marine Corps Reserve. I was with a bridging company as a combat engineer. Cool. So, yeah. Where did that take you in your your journey? Um, so because I was in the reserves, I turned 20 in boot camp, turned 21 overseas in Iraq. So I, right after my MOS school was right after 9-11. Wow. So yeah, we were busy repairing bris- bridges that were being um, destroyed. <laughs> Which there was plenty of that going on, wasn't there? Absolutely. So that's, so that's a big part of who you are, you know, really, uh, that's a huge piece of, of Leslie is your, your past history in the military. And it really seems to be giving you guidance as to what you're doing with your life and your career at this point. Yeah, I would say that's what specifically what led me into the outdoors. Um, after um, getting deployed and coming back stateside, I just had a really hard time readjusting back into civilian life. And unfortunately, I didn't have the right tools and I just chose to drink and party as a form to cope with it. Yeah. And um, that was crippling my marriage, hurting my children. So I pretty much got the ultimatum, you know, get your life together, do something or hit the road. And because I worked an eight to four job, I was like, okay, what's going to keep me out of the bars and out of getting into trouble? So I actually taught myself how to night fish and I became really good at catfishing at night, trophy (laughs) catfishing. And I just like, it helped me so much and something clicked and I started looking for other veterans that were doing stuff outdoors and using it as a form of therapy for themselves. And that's where I decided to start a nonprofit, Heroes Outdoor Therapy and help other veterans that were in similar situations as myself. So was there, was there a person or somebody that there had to have been something that got you into, into that, into fishing? Like that's a totally obscure type of fishing. So like (laughs) there had to have been something that pointed you in that direction. Well, my husband did grow up outdoors. Um, His father owned a sporting goods store. So he did shoot a lot of archery, did a lot of hunting. Um, he didn't do as much of the fishing scene, but I am really fortunate that I live on a really good lake for cat fishing, um, flathead fishing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of just like fueled me to like pick up my own hobby and become good at it. Do something that I enjoyed for myself. Yeah. And I, that, it seems like the cat fishing stuff. I, I just had l- listened to, uh, who was Johnny Utah was on with the guys from working class a couple of weeks ago. And he was talking about the, talking about the, just the catfishing scene. And it's, it seems like it's like an emerging, right. It's, it's growing in popularity and it's It's something that growing. Um, so I'm really good friends with him and we've been, um, like we're really grassroots and we've just been looking to immerse ourselves in more into the social media, pick up bigger sponsors. And he also has, um, Johnny Utah creative. So he does a lot of photography and videography and I thought he would be perfect for that. So that's how he's gotten involved in it. But it is everyone that comes out, they're like, Oh, what do you mean a catfishing tournament? Because everybody hears about bass tournaments. um, But they don't hear that much about catfishing tournaments. And it really actually pays out really well. The particular tournament that I am C4 is the cat masters. And they normally pay between 20,000 and $50,000 for first place. So yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's so much, I guess it all comes back to marketing, right? I mean, everybody thinks about bass masters and bass fishing tournaments because that's on ESPN on Sunday mornings, you know, it's, right. so it's just getting in the limelight and getting people to know about it. I mean, the, the fish are gigantic, you know, they and, are. and seeing, well, like seeing you catching some of these fish, they're as big <laughs> as you are. It's like, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Let me tell you, it does a lot. Sometimes I like try to just suck it up. I'm like, I'm not going to look bad in front of these guys. I'm on camera right now. (laughs) But sometimes I've had, I've almost gone overboard with them. So yeah. yeah, But I think think that's one thing that I like that separates um, the bass tournaments from the catfishing tournaments is that catfishing, typically you're allowed a three to four man team. So you can 
fish with your family, fish with other um, individuals, and it's more of a team um, sport. Yeah. So go, going back to your, you know, you getting started with catfishing, um, I guess kind of let's just like start from there. You know, we kind of got off on some some trails on on that end of stuff. But so, so you getting started with the catfishing, um, you were, where were you at? Where were you at able to go fishing like that and get into it? Did you have a boat? Did you have somebody you no, knew that I had actually, that? Okay, no. So when I first started, it was very much like go to Bass Pro, pick up one of Bill Dance's rods and figure this out. <laughs> like very yeah. 101. Um, I would bank fish and I would just sit along the bank and there would be some, some nights I wouldn't catch anything. And I would actually come home crying and my husband would be like, why are you crying? I'm like, I sat out there all night and didn't catch one fish. No buts. <laughs> um, so it's, it was all trial and error, learning um, what bait worked, what rigs worked, uh, what locations were good locations to fish on on the river. Um, and like I said before, I, even though I, was, I had plenty of unsuccessful nights, I like the fact that I was still getting out and trying and it was something about just being outdoors that was relaxing and therapeutic, um, especially to help my anxiety and my depression issues. So I, like I said, I started looking for other veterans that were just appreciating being outdoors. And I happened to run into a veteran on social media that did professional catfishing tournaments. Um, and he invited me to fish with him in Alabama, an army veteran. He invited me, he's like, Hey, I'm going to fish winter blues in Alabama. You're more than welcome to come along. And I hopped on a plane and I went, (laughs) (laughs) um, we ended up placing 42nd out of like 180 boats. I did end up losing a big fish (laughs) for that tournament. So I've never heard the end of it. Oh yeah. Uh, I enjoyed myself and that was my introduction to the tournament world. That's cool. So that that's like in getting connected with people. I mean, it's, I feel like it's fairly easy to connect with people, but to connect with people that are trying to connect with you for the right reasons and that are, have also gone through some of the challenges that you have. So like you, you know, you meet this, this guy and you go down there, you go fishing with him. Is at that point, is that when you start when you start hot hero outdoor therapy, is that what got you driven to start that? Or did you already Uh, have it at that point? No, what, what, what was happening during my research with looking for nonprofits, I was realizing there was a trend with nonprofits, especially smaller nonprofits where they would offer um, a hunt or a fishing trip for veterans. So let's say I'm in Pennsylvania and there's a particular nonprofit in Utah and they were offering a hunt but they weren't paying travel expenses for it. For me, for me, if I was on a fixed income, like most veteran uh, disabled veterans are, maybe I didn't have that buffer that I needed financially to help me pay for a $600, $600 plane ticket to go on this hunt. So even though the hunt was free, I still wasn't able to, you know, reap the, reap the rewards of being a veteran. And right. have- yeah. Oh, great. You got a, you got a $3,000 hunt, but you have a thousand dollar travel expenses. How are you going to get there? Right. Yeah. So I actually started, um, heroes outdoor therapy to bridge that gap, uh, and pay travel expenses for other veterans to be able to attend outdoor, um, functions and recreation. And I did that for a couple of years. So okay. that's what started that. That's, it's interesting. So then, so then people that, I mean, you had to get funding, you had to get people donating money to that. So how did you get into kind of running that end of things? So that's when I met Aaron, I went um, to several tournaments and I decided to um, create because I love the tournament world um, at the time. I still do, but I don't, I don't fish them as much now. Now I MC them. Um, that's when I created a specific category in, in tournaments that's called um, veteran big fish. So veterans that were registering to um, compete in these tournaments would also be competing among themselves for a veteran big fish award. Um, and that was a monetary award that usually my husband and I would start um, and we cover whatever fee um, it took to register for the event. Typically it's like a $500 fee. 
Um, and we had smaller sponsors that would donate tackle or rods or whatnot. Um, and then that picked up throughout the tournament world. Um, I had several different um, tournament um, directors approach me and wanting to start that. And that's where I grew in the tournament world and people found out about my nonprofit. And most of the financial backing at that time was raised through the catfish community. So just kind of it start, you, you started it and then it's just kind of to yeah. continue to feed itself. And right. it's almost like self-funding, which is cool. And that's, I guess that was one of the things I was interested about, about you with this. I mean, it, it seems like it's really started growing and probably a lot of that's because of Johnny's help on the marketing end of it. I, you know, I was going through your Instagram page today, prior to the conversation, and you could, you could sense his touch on, on some of the video and the pictures and stuff. And, and I, I think, think that just kind of helps it continue to build steam and grow a bit. Right. Cause I think at the end of the day, um, people like to donate, but they also like to see what you're doing with that money. And if you could offer that three to five minute video on your event or a couple nice pictures for corporate sponsors, they'd like to see that kind of stuff for marketing and just for feel good also. Yeah, for sure. And, and nowadays there's, there's so many nonprofits out there and without really truly seeing it, you wonder where exactly the money's going. But I think, you know, in this realm of hunting and outdoors, fishing, things of that nature, people like to give back and like to feel that they're helping, helping others. And I think what you're doing with this organization is pretty cool and pretty unique, um, that it is focused on the outdoors and something that myself and all of our listeners are very passionate about, you know, so the ability to, whether it is financially or like, how do you see, how do you see this moving forward? Do you see like creating a network of people that are out there that are willing to take veterans hunting? Um, how do you kind of see everything continuing to grow with your organization? Um, that is something that I've kind of been like looking um, and analyzing myself here. Uh, I know we're re really established in the cat in the fishing world. We have a lot of fishing guides that are willing to help and take veterans out. Um, we started last year um, doing smaller hunts, turkey, boar, the pheasant hunt. Um, and we're, we're doing well with that. It takes a lot more funding to do the elk hunts and the bigger hunts. Um, so we try to focus on smaller stuff where we can get um, that four to six group of veterans. That way they um, have a community that they can go to a certain event, create bonds and you know take that back home with them. Um, but I also have noticed that not everybody's gonna be into the fishing, not everybody's gonna be into the hunting. So what I ideally see in the future happening is focusing on veterans that are doing other stuff in their community. Um, there is one female veteran that I've been talking to in North Carolina and she has an equestrian facility and that's something that she's really passionate about. Yeah. So I'd like to incorporate um, veterans throughout the nation that are doing things outdoors in a different aspect and be able to share that through heroes outdoor therapy. Yeah. I think that's, so, and you, are you seeing it more of like a, a group, you know, you have seems like so far you've done more group type scenarios. You see it kind of continue like that or, or more any opportunity for like individual, like, let's say I want to take a, a veteran out hunting and do something that you see that as something that oh, you guys yeah. could. No. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I see that there's, there's plenty of people that reach out to us and say, Hey, I have private land. I'd like to take somebody out, you know, and that, that is awesome. We definitely invite that also as well. Yes. Sure. So how, how do people, I've just shoot you just social media. Is that the easiest way for people to get in touch with you on that? Yeah. It seems like social, a lot of people, um, there's more, um, person, personal, like personal interaction, people yeah, yeah, on social media through Facebook. We're on Instagram. We do have email as well on our website. So, okay. Um, so I think that gives people a good idea what you've got going on with, with hero outdoor therapy. And I definitely encourage people to check that out. It sounds like you got some cool stuff going there and it sounds like it's just continuing to grow and more and more opportunity. So I know, myself and many others, you know, if there's ever the opportunity, you have somebody up in the upstate New York area of someone who's looking, you know, whether myself personally, or you know, maybe I can point in the right direction. If you have anybody that is interested, you know, definitely point them in our direction. Cause we'd be happy to, 
to help out for sure. But anybody else out there that's listening that feels like they'd like to reach out to Leslie and offer their whatever they have, whether it's property resources, know of a cool thing to do. Maybe you are a guide or an outfitter um, and would like to get involved. Definitely give her a holler. Yeah. And that's something that I like to stress on, especially because I, like I said, I didn't grow up outdoors by any means. Am I the great hunter or the best angler in the world, but I'm also growing. This is something that worked for me and I'm willing to take advice, criticism, anything from other people, because at the end of the day, my mission is to help other veterans. And I'm still currently, you know, helping myself day to day continue this. So yeah, for sure. Well, I want to, I want to hear some stories. Cause I know you got stories between <laughs> fishing and hunting. I'm, I'm interested. So on the, on the hunting perspective. So right. what, what's your journey been like on the hunting side? Because you, it's not something that you ever grew up around, um, that you had any experience with. So how, what's that been for you as you've worked up? Like how long has it been? Where did you get started? Um, so I think I would have, I probably would have gotten started on my father-in-law's land. Um, but that was several years ago, probably like eight, nine years ago is when I shot my first deer. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are surprised that I've actually shot an elk <laughs> before. I've never shot a buck. People, you ever shot a whitetail buck? <laughs> I've never shot a whitetail buck. My really? first rack animal was an elk in Utah, which was last year. Um, well, I'd but, like to hear that story when we get there. <laughs> Before that, I think I like enjoy turkey hunting. There's just something about turkey hunting. The, you know, they're so smart, and you kind of have to outsmart each other. So I don't know if it's that's the military thing in me that <laughs> I like it. But I've killed several turkeys, mainly in South Carolina. I still have yet to kill one in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, I think this year I'm going to be headed towards Kansas, um, Ohio, West Virginia, and then Pennsylvania. Cool. Are you going to be starting with that pretty soon? Because I know a lot of people are starting to travel quite a bit as we're getting into April. Yeah. I just got back from Alabama with um, closing out the cat master season. So yeah, I'm hopping right back into um, the turkey season. I think something cool about that is I started with you know, a guide calling for me. And last year was the first year that I've been calling on my own. And that's something fun. I can't mouth call though. That's something I have not mastered. (laughs) Not your game, huh? No. (laughs) Yeah. I'm, I'm learning. Like I can, I can mouth call pretty well, but I'm, I'm like a habitual over caller. You know, I get a, I get a gobbler going and I just cannot stop. And it's like, (laughs) why? I don't know why I never kill him. What's because you just don't stop calling Billy. That's why. So I was very close last year and I, I just blew the shot. I shot and missed, but next year or this year, if, and when I get out, I hope I can get out more than I did last year. We had our, we had a baby girl last year, May 8th. So, so it was like, I just, I basically hunted, I hunted like three days at the beginning of the month. And then, and then I basically hunted, I think one day and that was it the rest of the season. But yeah, mouth calling, mouth calling is a lot of fun, but if you're doing, if you're calling that much, you're, that's the one thing I keep hearing people say on podcasts and everything else. Like you can over call. And if you love the sound of your call, you're probably calling too much. (laughs) No, I only, I only pot call. I do a little bit of box calling, but I prefer pot calling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last year I was trying to fill my second tag in South Carolina and I, I don't know. I think I just became a little excited. I just started pot calling and I, it was right when I sat down and I wasn't prepared. My shotgun was on my lap (laughs) and the Tom came out probably like, I would say like four yards to my right. And exactly. I was so shocked and it was so quick that I was just, was it thick or were you in a blind or no, I, it was thick. I was, Yeah. yeah. I was in the thick of it in South Carolina and I was just not prepared. <laughs> like my shotgun was on my lap. I was on the ground. I was like, what? <laughs> but that's something, that's why I want to start mouth calling. Cause I feel like, you know, right. <laughs> yeah. That's the benefit for sure. You know, but it is, it's such a, it's, it's one of those things like my brother and I started with Turkey calls when we were really, really young. Dad had mm-hmm. us doing them when we were young and I don't and a lot of it kind of started just with our mouths without actually without actually using a diaphragm call oh really yeah so 
you almost kind of get used to like the cadence and the pressure you're putting in your mouth. I feel like that made it a lot easier. And the same thing when I started learning how to elk call, like it just seemed to come, I'm not a good elk caller, but just the actual process of making the noise and actually projecting it, you know, it seemed much easier just because you had the experience with the Turkey diaphragm, which I know they say it's totally different ways of forcing air and how you direct the air and everything else. It's much different, but it seemed much easier. Whereas I've got friends who have, they can't diaphragm Turkey call. And they also really struggle with a, you know, with a bugle, with a diaphragm call in. So I don't know. There's but. always these small lessons learned though, that I learned on every hunt. And I would say my South Carolina hunt taught me to always look down at where I sit because I sat on a bed of red ants oh. on my last day. And I was so covered up that I did not realize I was on a bed of ants until they were all over my hands and on my face. So they had crawled all the way up. And I had to drive home back to Pennsylvania that day. And I just remember I, I couldn't hack it. I had to take a Benadryl and it was a miserable ride. Oh my home. God. It's awful. Yeah. yeah. I ticks are ticks are the problem here. You know, we it's the ticks seem to be getting worse and worse every year here in New York. I don't know about Pennsylvania, but yeah, they're bad here too. Are they? they are. Yeah. It's God awful. So we, I'm always just thinking about it. Like I'm just paranoid. <laughs> So like when I sit down, I'm, I'm like brushing everything off. I got oh, a nice, no. nice clean dirt to sit on. Yeah. I don't think I worry about them until I get home and then I find one on me. I'm yeah. not that paranoid about that. I don't know. I, I can think thank I'm worried my... about ants now though. <laughs> yeah, I would be too. That's, that's uncomfortable. Those, I mean, they, they bite, right? Those. Oh yeah. They burn. Ants. They yeah, burn. They, they so hurt. They're, they basically yeah. fire ants. Like, is that another yeah, name? Fire fire ants. Ants. Yeah. Right. That's what it was. No, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have it, you know, I'll take ticks over having to worry about snakes and all these crazy ants and different bugs to be coming over yet. Like it gets to be the end of the end of May and we get awful with mosquitoes and the black flies get started and that's zero fun. But, uh, yeah, I'll take that stuff every day over freaking snakes and spiders and every other damn thing that can. Oh, I love I think I, got I you lost back. you there for a little bit, so I couldn't hear you. <laughs> oh, I was just saying that I hate creepy crawly things. That's what oh, I, was I don't like anything that can crawl in inside your ears, up your nose. No, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So you, so you're gonna, are you gonna work on the diaphragm call then? Or are you gonna start working on that? What the hell? I keep losing you. Hold on a second. Uh, I got you now. Yeah, I have you now. I don't know what's going on. Must I'm not my, sure. Must be my internet. I'll <laughs> I'll clean this up in post. Okay. As they say in the production business. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Sometimes it seems like the internet decides it wants to work and it doesn't want to work. I still don't got you. The hell. Hello. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Yeah, I'm not the, sure. I just shut the Wi-Fi off on my... I'm going to take you upstairs a little closer to the router. Okay. Finish the discussion. Take you on a tour of the old <laughs> Harvey Palace here. All right. Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, So I was asking you if you're going to work on trying to get going with the diaphragm call this year i am i think I'm some of the try. lessons <laughs> i think i'm gonna try my husband isn't a fan of his though i mean he can diaphragm call um he doesn't hunt as much now and he had a bad experience with him almost choking on one so. <laughs> oh really yeah that can it can get dangerous uh when you go running and uh especially if you shoot one you jump up and start running you could <laughs> You could make one of those things disappear in a heartbeat right. and uh, hope to God it comes out at some point. Yeah. But this out call, I, d I don't know how to out call. I mean, I did my hunt, but I did that through um, using a guide. So did you? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's fun, but it's funny. Cause I mean, we live out here in the East and I mean, I'm going to elk hunt maybe once every two, three years, maybe. So mm -hmm. I'm not practicing it all the time. So it right. gets to be that time when you're getting ready to go on one of these trips and you bust it out and 
could turn on the Corey Jacobson tutorials and, <laughs> and have him teach you how to do it. And then you go out there and it's like, I hope I'm doing this right. But right. it's, uh, it's definitely fun, like learning how to, how to call these different things, because we don't have a lot of that stuff here. And, and even, even around here and we're, I don't know if it's just the way the turkeys are here in the East or in New York and how pressured they are, but they're not very talkative. You know, a lot of the best turkey hunters here in this area, they don't call. They, they just know where they are and they set up on them and they sit and wait. So. So for my, um, elk hunt that I did in Utah, I did it in, um, Ogden and it was on 10,000 acres and it was the first week of October and they weren't calm. They weren't bugling either. Um, I actually took, it took, my hunt was only supposed to be five days and I begged the guy, <laughs> I said, listen, I have to go host a tournament. I'll come back to fill my tag. Um, and he was like, now we can stay two extra days. That's all I have. So I stayed on, on the sixth day, we spotted the herd. Um, and I actually did a 400 yard shot and it was awesome. He bugled right before oh. I shot him and it was so great. Um, I only have cell phone footage of it though. I, I really wish I could have had Johnny Utah there. Oh yeah. <laughs> that for me would have been the most epic thing to have on video. Uh, unfortunately, my friend that was with me, I startled him because I didn't tell him or the guy that I was going to shoot. I think I just kicked into military mode. Like I got him. He's in sight. Bam, dead. <laughs> so I startled them. Like I did my shot and the the camera went like that. Um, so he did get him. I hit him on my first shot and he did get him getting back up. It took three more shots to get him down. Damn. Um, but yeah. Was, was that something you were, what were you using for a gun? A 308. Yeah. I have a, a Bugera that I got for it. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, did, did you have the opportunity? I mean, were you prepared for a shot at that distance or was that a little bit of a poke for you? Um, no, I think, I think the whole military aspect of it helped. Um, I mean, it's not anything I had done before out in a hunting environment, but I mean. Comfortable I, enough with the weapons. Yeah, I think I'm a pretty good shot for the most part. Yeah, and that's I, I talk about it on here all the time, especially for for new hunters. I think they're behind the ball a little bit just because they don't have the experience shooting. Right. Whereas whereas people that grew up, whether it is in a past career like you had, or if it's you know just somebody that grew up around guns, you just get so comfortable and confident with just pulling the gun up and shooting that there's a lot of that natural like hand eye coordination that goes with it. Right. And no, I, I definitely think that the military background does help with just being comfortable and having that pressure on me. A lot of people that I, because I didn't grow up, I I'd normally start with guides and a lot of them, I get my shot and they just look at me. They're like, are you excited? And I'm like, because I'm so serious. I actually don't get excited until I walk up to the animal and I know he's dead. <laughs> and yeah. then I start giggling. That's all I know how to do. But my shot, I just remain like stone cold and they're like celebrating already. And I'm like, uh, -uh. <laughs> yeah, they're probably not used to somebody that's like, yes, yeah, my first elk hunt. And you, you drop, you drop a bullet at 400 yards and they're like, well, are you okay? Like, are you freaking out or? <laughs> yeah, no, now it's like, okay, let's go hike across the Canyon, <laughs> quarter it out, you know, hike, pack it out and then we'll get excited. <laughs> yeah. Was that a, was that like a, was that a, like a pack in camp, like a, a spike camp or were you going in and out each day? We were going in and out each day, um, but I still had to pack it out. So there were um, a group of other hunters that were around um, that had um, four wheelers and they came up to help, but I was really adamant that I was going to carry my own rack and my own hideout. And they're like, um, that weighs more than a hundred pounds. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> it's like, unless I'm crawling and dead on the ground, I'm going to soak in as much as this experience as I can. <laughs> but you know what? The hunt, last hundred yards of it, I was eating my words because I was hurting. Oh, it yeah. It really sucked. It yeah, there's, <laughs> especially, especially those loads are not, they're not like controllable, no. you know, especially with the horns and the head. 
Oh monster. yeah, I definitely had like a spotter behind me, like turn, like <laughs> my rack was getting stuck everywhere. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. 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 It's carrying those heavy packs out is, uh, how far of a walk out was it? Was it a, was it a mile plus or was it, where were you looking at? No, I would say it was a mile. It was definitely not a mile plus. Yeah. Um, it was just downhill, you know, cause we, we went up the Canyon and back down. Um, but I just, like I said, I wanted to soak in as much as the experience as I, as I could. I mean, being in Utah and the elevation in Pennsylvania is nothing compared to where we were yeah. in Utah. That was about 800. Yeah. Um, and just going for a stroll there, if you're not used to it, really hurts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody who's, especially us East Coasters, it's so hard to get prepared for that. You just cannot. You right. just can't. I mean, you can do a little bit. We do have some hills, some quote unquote mountains, but then you go out there and it's just a shock to the system. Oh no. Our elevation here, the locally, the highest I can get is a uh, 1200. Yeah. And that's nothing compared to Utah. No. My parents actually live in Utah. So I had gone out a month before um, to visit them and they're very athletic. Like they love um, hiking, they love running and I'm just like, not about it. So they took me on a little hike and I was dying. <laughs> I was like terrified of going on this elk hunt. I'm like, Oh, I thought I was prepared. I'm definitely not, <laughs> but you know, you suck it up and you do your own. I think it's just so beautiful out there and you're just so pumped for the hunt itself that you just kind of just run off of adrenaline. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, it, and you got to take a minute and soak it in. I don't know. I don't know if, how, what your feelings are, but I feel like, you know, the, the trips I've been on out there and even the stuff you do locally, anything you do, regardless of whether it's some big trip or not me personally, I'm trying to slow down and take it all in. And just, even if I'm just sitting down for just a minute right. and just, just taking it in because so many times you do these trips, or you do something memorable and it's just like rushing to get onto the next point or onto the next thing. And it's like, you might never get that feeling back, you know, like, Oh, I definitely, definitely soak in the scenery whenever I can. Um, especially on those Utah hunts where you're just in the middle of the mountains, no cell phone reception, nothing. And you're just unplugged from the rest of the world. Yeah. It's definitely really therapeutic. It sure is. Um, so you're big into Turkey. You shot your first bull elk. You haven't shot a whitetail buck. When's that going to happen? You, you must have that on the radar. I'm going to try. I'm actually going to try to do it in Ohio or in Texas, but we'll see. Um, hopefully Canada opens because I do have a hunt scheduled in December um, for that. So, and that's going to be an open tag because it is on an Indian reservation. Cool. So I can actually do um, mule deer, whitetail, elk, and caribou, I believe. You can shoot one or you can shoot one of each. No, you can shoot one. So you, you get one animal and you can shoot any of those. Correct. Okay. Correct. That's neat. I never heard of a tag like that. Yeah. So, well, you can only have them on Indian reservations. So. And they probably only give out so many, right? It's not right. like you can, anybody right. can go there and do that. Yeah. And it's through someone that I met um, at the Harrisburg outdoor show probably just me randomly going saying hello to everyone <laughs> i'm sure that's how it happened that's why we're sitting here <laughs> yeah it's got to kind of suck i mean a huge part of what you do and, and especially with both the organization and your personal side of the business you know just you being you out there marketing yourself um you know these outdoor shows are a huge piece of that and oh, i really i really hope they they that this is the last spring slash summer that we got to deal with not having these because it definitely hurts. I hope so too. I was able to go to the um, Iowa classic a couple weeks ago and that was just so great to see people coming out. We didn't have to wear masks. So hopefully it changes soon because I'm kind of over it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was the vibe there? I just, I, I think that's one of the few shows that have happened the spring what no, was just I the mean, vibe like people just excited as hell just to be out of their cages or what right right I mean I, there was a good turnout I mean I'm, I, that was the first time that I've been to that um so I don't really know what their previous turnout was but it was busy I mean people were coming out it was great to see everyone yeah 
Yeah. The, ne the networking side of, of this with the outdoors, you know, what, whatever you're doing, whether you're doing a podcast or you've got a, a, a business like yourself, like, I mean, the networking is huge and there's so right. much out there now with social media that I don't know. I, I guess I'd be kind of curious your perspective on it. Like I, I feel like social media, especially over this last year is kind of just like people aren't engaging as much with it. I feel like as people were before and my statement for saying that is like, I think a lot of people have checked out. I know a lot of my personal friends and even myself, like I've backed away from my phone a lot. I think a lot of that has to do with the culture that's happening right now in politics and the whole cancel culture. You kind of like go on social media and you see that meme or that post where it's like, okay, I'm over this already. Like yeah. I can't even go on my phone because it's just going to cause me to get mad or, you know, <laughs> So I think that's what a lot of it also has to do. So I, I, I do. And a lot of our posts are also being censored. A lot of the outdoor hunting posts. Yeah. I've, I've seen several people and I, I don't know, we did a, we've got a shed fest going on right now. Uh, it's, we're kind of just doing a shed hunting contest, but it's, it's uh, essentially a membership drive for the national deer association. And I never, I've never put, you know, money towards marketing or advertising mm -hmm. stuff on Instagram or Facebook, but they offered to give me a little bit of money to put towards some, some advertising. And I was just like blown away by the, by how like it didn't do anything. Like it literally did nothing. Like for that one week period that I had those advertising dollars applied, there was like zero. I mean, I literally got not a single order. Yeah. For, for it. And I, and I couldn't help but wonder if they didn't want that post to actually do well, you know, because why wouldn't it? Like I was sharing it to groups that all the people in the groups are shed hunters. Like that's the group it's New York shed hunters. It's like, why would no one in this group even like this post? It doesn't make any sense to me. Right. And even as my nonprofit, I actually am not allowed to share my website through Facebook and I can't share my email through Facebook because really? it's, yeah, it, it's been like that for several years now because it was reported because we put, we would post hunting pictures or <laughs> stuff like that. And yeah. So, yeah, I, I worry about that stuff and I try not to get, it seems like it's me personally, I get myself worked up Monday through Friday <laughs> and then I, over the weekend, I put my phone down. I just like fade away and I enjoy my family and everything. And then the work week comes back around and I'm listening to podcasts and listen to all this stuff going on. And it's like, this is just crazy because at the end of the day, most people are good. You have a, a small portion of every community group. That's a bad representation. Right. And you've got all of us now have gotten to the point where we really do rely on these platforms for our personal, both our personal and our business relationships and growth and opportunities to meet new people and to spread the words of what we're up to. So here we are dependent on these platforms and you don't know whether your stuff is actually getting out there, if it's reaching the, the people that you want it to. And then when you become solely reliant on it, it's like, well, I don't know, it's like, I'm just peeing in the wind sometimes. It's like, well, am I, am I reaching new people? Probably not because they're not encouraging this post to be pushed, you know? No, no. And I think within the last couple of months, you've seen even a bigger um, push with censorship on, on Facebook and on Instagram. Both. Mm -hmm. What's, um, yeah. what's it, what's it like for you? I mean, you're a, you're a woman in the outdoors. And I think that's something that's there's been a, a, I think there was a surge of it and it seems like it's calmed down a little bit over the last maybe six months ish, where there was this big surge of all these women coming in and it was all about, you know, fish bras and all this other stuff. And yeah, it, but... <laughs> go ahead. That's something where I, I've always stressed upon. I've never wanted, like I've gone a shot and done all that too. And I'd have worked expos, but I don't ever want to be considered like a gun bunny or, or like a social media, uh, huntress influencer. I think I, 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 it's really important for me to communicate to people that I don't consider myself a hunter. I'm learning every day. I'm learning in the fishing world, 
but I do want to surround myself with people that have the experience, you know, cause what's the best way to learn from, from people that are out there every day doing it. And I'm not afraid to approach people and ask them as you know, yeah, for sure. Approach people. Um, so yeah, I think for women that are taking that side, you know, there's only a small window of how far you can market yourself in that aspect. And I rather just grow day to day and earn the respect. Um, if I become good at a, a specific um, targeted hunt, then great. If I do jump into whitetail or stay with turkey, I just want to be respected and grow little by little. Yeah. So. And I've, I've grown to respect you a lot over the last year from watching you and following along because it's very evident. Um, you know, I'm at a show and I, and you come walking up and you're bubbly and you got your fishing shirt on and it's like, Oh, geez. Like, you know, I'm not going to lie. Like your first impressions, like, Oh, here's another one of these girls like out at a show. And, um, <laughs> that's awful of me to say that. Cause that's me no, judging I, the book. But no, I get it. <laughs> as I follow you throughout the last year, it's like this, like she's genuine, like, and she's very passionate about this. And you, you are, I can tell you're doing this all for the right reasons. And on, obviously with going back to, to your nonprofit, it's like, you're trying to make a difference in people's lives. And I see the, I see the people that are, that are gravitating towards you. And I have a lot of respect for them, you know, like Johnny Utah, like um, Mike Hearn. I know, you know, Mike and mm -hmm. you, you know, with the military background you guys have in common there. And like, I, I keep an eye on, I watch the people that are in the quote unquote industry that, right. you know, how, how they are reacting to people and whether they're welcoming them in or kind of trying to keep their distance. And it's very obvious that you're genuine and real and true as you're yeah. uh, out there and presenting I, yourself to people. And I appreciate that. And um, it helps to have like somebody like Johnny in my corner guiding, helping to guide me because if I do something, he's not afraid to check me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's important. We yeah. all have those people in our lives. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think it also helps that I have that military background where I was the only female in my unit. So I had to, you know, pick and choose how I was going to prove myself and how I was going to make others see myself. And, um, and then I went and actually worked corrections. I worked in all, um, male maximum security, pr um, prisons. So Did you really? Helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you that was interesting. <laughs> It was. So I think a lot of that background that I have does help me to have tough skin, but also know how to how to approach and how to try to conduct myself around people that I want to gain respect from. Yeah, it's good stuff. So who are, I guess, kind of rounding the conversation out, like who are some of the some of the organizations and the, the companies and the people that you are working with, um, you know, both with personally and with your, with your business? Right. So, um, I would say that for heroes outdoor therapy, we do have grizzly coolers. That's been helping a lot. Um, we just signed with, um, Livingston lures. They're huge in the, ba the bass industry, but, okay. um, through trial and error, we've come up with a rig for the catfish industry to work on. So that's really been huge for us with this tournament series. Um, there's so many, there's so many, my husband, what? Oh yeah. Casking. Casking has been huge. That's who you were with at uh, Western York show, right? I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, yeah, I think so. I, I've done so many they, shows. They had this, they had the big booth over there and I want to say that it was Casking that you were there with that day and I hadn't heard of them, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's so many, I mean, there's so many that I just like forget half of them half the time. I know that sounds so horrible. But I'm wanna, on I know I'm putting you on the spot I'm and I don't want you to I'm like, let me bring out my cue cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Troy, Troy could be holding those up in the background for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's on, on the hero side. Um, right. What else? I mean, anybody, you know, personally, some people that you look up to, I mean, we've talked about Johnny, but anybody else that you, you know, really look to as a mentor you know, people that you strive to be like here in the I outdoor world? I mean, like, I like Johnny because I know him personally. Um, people that I don't know personally, one person that I always watch every single video would be um, John Bartlow. I love watching his videos. 
Cause I just, every time there's something that I pick up from him, I think he has that experience already. From sick, from sicker, right? Right. Yeah. 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 He's a fascinating dude. Every same thing here, any podcast he does, any videos he posts, and he's been much more putting a lot more content out on Instagram, you know, with his tech tips and things like that. So yeah, I definitely encourage people to follow him if you're not, because Mm -hmm. he's a very knowledgeable individual. And that's like, we're in such a cool time now when you think about it, because there's so many of you veterans out there now that are post service time and are now like becoming just people out about in our in normal everyday life, but you're bringing all the training and knowledge and experience you have where for many, you know, what we had, we had no wartime, anything for, for what a 20 year period or so 20, 30 year period. So now we've got this influx of all these people from the early two thousands through current that are wrapping up their careers and coming out into the public space. Right. And And there's so much good knowledge and information out there. Yeah. And now you bring that out. I recently have gotten to do a lot of stuff with female veterans, not our mother wives. You know, Um, I went on a goose hunt in Illinois. um, And then I went on a duck hunt in Texas, which was all just better female veterans. Cool. Um, So yeah, that's something that I like dabbing into. Hopefully I'd like to start archery hunting. Um, but again, like I'm slowly learning everything that I don't want to get too overwhelmed, <laughs> yeah. but either that's easy to do easy to like come up with a new, like, okay, well now I'm going to start fly fishing, which I've said I wanted to learn to do, but then you kind of get sucked into it and it's a whole different, <laughs> my husband's bank account <laughs> goes like <this. laughs> <Yes>. shrinks. <laughs> I know. Well, you only got so many hours in the day too. And it's like, Every time I reach out to you, like, oh, yeah, I'm driving here. I'm coming back from there. And it's like, Jesus, she's all over the the place. That's the problem with me being so friendly and wanting to do everything that I'm like, sure, sure, I'll come down. (laughs) Yeah, I'll drive to Alabama. Or did you fly to Alabama? You must must have flown, right? No. you drove. drove. Yeah, that was a 13-hour drive. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of miles on the old rig. Oh yeah. I actually got a new vehicle because I was putting so many miles on the old one. So (laughs) yeah. Got to do that sometimes. Yeah. I I actually like, um, driving instead of flying. It just helps to have your vehicle there. And yeah, you're on your schedule, right? I lost you. I lost you. I'm blaming this internet on you. This isn't me. (laughs) Maybe, maybe I need to go upstairs and yell at my son and tell him to get off his Xbox. Yeah, yeah that's what the problem is. He's playing <laughs> Fortnite or something. What are kids playing nowadays? Fortnite. Our kid plays Call of Duty, a lot of Call of Duty. Call of Duty, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mom and dad got him, got him playing that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I can't believe that. I mean, that game has stayed extremely relevant. That was, that was oh, like a yeah, big one. It has. It when has. We were kids and now it's still the the go-to game for everybody to play. I can't play video games to save my life. No. (laughs) I used to play them all the time. And then I grew up and PlayStation just sits there. Nobody giving it attention. (laughs) But this is what it is, you know? Now I'm outside doing stuff. So that's cool. Right. But uh, the weather's starting to be um, a lot nicer now. So I'll be out doing hikes again. Yeah. You guys actually had quite the winter too. Usually you guys aren't necessarily in the, in the snow belt down there, but you guys got hit with some pretty good storms this year. Yeah, we did. We did. It's nice to see the grass, but it was woke up this morning and we had snow on the ground here. And it's like, son of a gun. It was like 70 degrees multiple times last week. We're all ready for it. We're yeah, ready for spring. We had to come back from Alabama, even though we had a lot of tornadoes down there while we were down there. Our tournament actually was cut a day short on the front end of it because of tornadoes. Damn. Well, I think I'd rather still deal with that type of weather than snow. <laughs> I'm kind of ah, over. <laughs> I disagree strongly with that, but no. we can we can disagree on something, Leslie. Yeah, That's well, right. I'm moving down south. So <laughs> are you guys moving down there? Yeah, we are. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like that's where you're spending a lot of your time. So it only makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, good deal. Um what uh so you just want to give some quick plugs to again wrapping it out with the uh, heroes outdoor therapy and 
And anything else you want to plug quick before we wrap her up? No, I just encourage people or veterans, anyone that wants to help um, with Heroes Outdoor Therapy to reach out. Like I said, by any means, am I an expert on hunting or fishing? So if we could help other veterans out together, I am more than willing to listen and take advice and anything that anybody wants to offer. Amen to that. I appreciate what you're doing there. It's uh, it's good stuff and and uh, helping others get through their through their challenges and through those tough times and try to give them that uh, that camaraderie and that group you know group dynamic and give them purpose. Um, I love seeing that. The outdoors are a great thing to do for people, and uh, I definitely encourage encourage people to go over and check you out on social media, both you know your pages for Heroes Outdoor Therapy as well as uh, your personal page. I was watching some of the videos, like I was saying, you got your pheasant hunt video up there and some of the, the catfishing stuff. And it's a lot of fun to, to see what's going on. And it's, it's just different content. And uh, it's really enjoyable to watch some of these guys out there doing that stuff, guys and girls out there doing that stuff to uh, let some of that stress go and find peace with some things. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. It was nice catching up with you and uh, we'll stay in touch. All right. Thanks, Billy, for having me. See ya. Thank you. Tell Troy I said hello. I will. All right. Thanks. See ya. Bye.